This discussion is about two of the smartest men ever, Isaac Newton and Emanuel Swedenborg. Newton is well known to school children for having an apple fall on his head. He's well known to scientists for changing the whole way we think about the world. Swedenborg, by contrast, is not well known at all. In 1687, Newton published what we know as the Principia. It described an unseen force called gravity that causes apples to fall, and also causes the earth to circle the sun. The Principia also gave mathematic formulas for how objects interact with each other. It was radical stuff. Before then, people thought apples fell because God created them with a desire to fall, and that other objects interacted at God's whim as well. By putting it all into equations, Newton took God out of the equation. Physical objects obeyed simple, unchanging physical laws. This sparked a huge change in society. People could use Newton's math to design machines, which led to the Industrial Revolution. They applied similar thinking to government, which led to the rise of democracy. And they applied it to the economy, which led to the rise of capitalism. Swedenborg, meanwhile, was born a year after the Principia was published, and grew up as an engineer and scientist building on Newton's ideas. But the one thing he couldn't see in Newton's ideas was a place for the human soul. That search led him to spend the second half of his life studying and writing about theology. In 1763, Swedenborg published what might be considered his own Principia, a book called Divine Love and Wisdom. It says that God's love is the actual substance of reality given form by God's wisdom. It describes a spiritual reality that relates to natural reality but is far more perfect. And it talks about God continually powering the universe, actually creating it anew every instant. How can God do all this? Divine love and wisdom says God is not bound by time and space as we know them, and that we have to rise above our ideas of time and space if we want to understand. Such fluid ideas of time and space were just silly at the time, and Swedenborg's concepts couldn't be tested, they couldn't be expressed mathematically, and they couldn't be observed in the world. As science, divine love and wisdom was a flop. But we now know that Newton was actually wrong. And looking at divine love and wisdom again, it seems Swedenborg may have been right. That part of the story starts with another of history's smartest men. Albert Einstein proved that gravity was not the mysterious force Newton said it was. Space and time actually form a sort of fabric of reality, and that fabric is warped by objects. What we see as gravity is really just objects following those warps. And even more weird, that same warping also speeds up or slows down time. Given that, Swedenborg's description of God's relationship with time and space doesn't sound quite so silly. Einstein also showed that matter, physical stuff, is really energy trapped in small bits of space. Release it from that space, and you can get a whole lot of energy, the basis of nuclear power. Call that energy divine love, and the form it's trapped in divine wisdom, and Swedenborg seems to really be onto something. Meanwhile, other scientists went a different way, into the bizarre field of quantum mechanics, the study of the tiniest particles of matter. Among other things, they found that empty space is actually full of what are called particle-antiparticle pairs. What happens with those is that nothingness divides itself into equivalent positive and negative somethingnesses, which then annihilate each other back into nothingness. And odd as that all sounds, this operation is key to the existence of... Well, it's key to the existence of existence. That sounds a lot like God creating the universe anew constantly. But there was a problem. Einstein appeared to be right about stars and galaxies, and quantum mechanics appeared to be right about particles. But use Einstein's formulas on quantum-sized objects, and the math falls apart. They couldn't both be right. That led to string theory, which held that quantum-sized particles weren't really particles. They were tiny, vibrating strings. This solved the conflict between Einstein and quantum mechanics, but did so by adding six extra dimensions to our familiar four-dimensional space-time. And string theory morphed into what's called M-theory, which added even more dimensions to solve problems with string theory. So current scientific thinking is that reality has at least ten dimensions. But where are they all? Why don't we experience them? Theorists say that we actually do, but that the extra dimensions are curled up into a tininess that our four-dimensional senses can't experience. That makes the spiritual reality Swedenborg described. A reality that corresponds to natural reality, but is fuller, more pure, and less bound by space and time, sound downright plausible. 
So does this all mean that Swedenborg was right about everything he wrote? We can't prove that. But as science closes in on theories that actually explain how reality works, reality looks a lot like what Swedenborg described. That makes us think that perhaps the world should take another look at his work.